Yo, what's going on, Remedy Nation, man? I am so excited to be before you again, man. Listen, this Wednesday, I just want to dive into this idea um, of stewardship and, and understanding financial stability and financial power and kingdom finances. Man, this past weekend, I taught a message titled The Money Trap. Now, if you haven't seen it, then you want to make sure that you go to our YouTube channel and watch it because I believe that that's the starting point of where God wants to take you or what God wants to use to take you to another level. Um, while I was teaching this past weekend, um, I kind of mentioned this idea of money giving a person some type of anxiety. Um, anxiety. Now, here's the truth. Um, I believe that to some degree, um, and right after I got finished teaching this, there was a, a woman who was a part of our ministry, very vital in our ministry. She said she came down. She said, Pastor, I'm acquiring a certain level of wealth. Um, I prayed for it. Hear me. That's what I love about it. I prayed for it. I planned for it. And God gave it to me. But now when I actually get what I've asked for, there's a certain level of anxiety that makes me either give it away, do something with it, spend it here, spend it there. And, and I just need to figure out what God wants me to do. Um, and I hope that today starts as a launching point um, for you to get better in your finances. Yes, I talked about it this weekend. Two things that the church never wants to talk about is money and sex. But then it's two things that many in the church struggle with. So, man, I'm going to be a pastor, man, that's going to obey God and really help you where you are. Anxiety. Here's the definition of it. Anxiety is defined as uh, apprehensive uneasiness or nervousness, usually over an impending or anticipated ill. It's a nervousness, an uneasiness, apprehension, Toward, toward something, that's anxiety, that, that's anxiety. So most people attribute this idea of anxiety to a mental state, right? Emotional state. I struggle with anxiety, so I'm always anxiety anxious. I'm always anxious about something. Um, and so now what I believe is that over time, I've seen individuals suffer from the idea of anxiousness, anxiety, when it comes to their finances. That's just the truth. And there is something that I want to talk to you about today, and that's financial anxiety. And those anxieties come in different ways, in different shapes, in different forms. But here's the reality. The reality is this. It is always causing you to have more problems than you one. So that's how I came up with this title. And I had to flip it after I came up with the original title. The original title was just going to be more money, more problems. But that's not where I wanted to stay because I really believe that more money, more problems. But here it is. No money, more problems. Both present a certain level of anxiety. The more money you get, the more decisions you have to make. If you don't have any money, then you have to make decisions based on survival. Now, regardless on who you are right now, no matter what your economic status is right now, no matter where you believe you live or where you land on the, the, the spectrum of class, you're either in one category or the other. You are trying to get more money or you have more money and you're trying to figure out what to do with it or you have no money or you don't have the amount of money that you need or that you want or that you're requesting and you need to figure out how to get to another level. Either way it goes, I believe that today will be a day that we can talk about problems. But because we're talking and we're starting this idea of managing our resources and managing our money, and I started with this idea of anxiety, 
Here's what the word of God says. And you know this scripture, but I want you to use and to parallel the scripture with the issues that you're having on a consistent basis. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. My wife says something to me on this past week. I said, sweetheart, I need to get away soon. Um, I really need to get away because I, I really need to think about the, the future of our ministry and think about what our ministry is going to look like in five years and think about what our ministry looks like in 10 years. And man, sweetheart, I, I really need to just, just get away because I have to think. And, and now while I'm talking to her, I'm fidgeting. And while I'm talking to her, my mind is racing. And while I'm talking to her, I'm worrying. And while I'm talking to her, there's so much that's going on in my mind. And my wife says, stop. She said, yes, you need to get away. But you don't need to get away so that you can figure out an answer. You need to get away because all that you are feeling, you need to make sure that you take all that you are feeling, the anxieties that you are feeling, the anxiousness that you are feeling, and you need to get away not to figure out the answer, but you need to get away so that you can give all your problems to the answer. Oh my goodness. Many of us are out here trying to find the answer when we don't understand and we're not really fully under understanding and, and really fully coming into the, the picture or, 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 or understanding that he is the answer. I don't need to look for an answer. I need to just look for him because the Bible is clear. He will remove my anxieties, not just because um, he's there and he likes to lift anxieties. No, the reason why he wants to remove my anxieties is because the word of God says he cares for me. He wants to remove the anxieties that you have in life because he cares. That's financial anxieties. That's relational anxieties. It's mental anxieties, spiritual anxieties. He wants to remove them because he cares. And even when it comes to our finances, we have to get to a point where we are not always trying to do the supernatural with the natural gift. We need to give the natural to the super so that supernatural can actually happen. He's the answer. So, in the process of all of this, the first thing after we've identified, okay, God wants to take my anxieties. First thing that I need you to do is identify the source of your financial anxiety. See, I don't want to play games. I know many of you who are watching right now, I talk to you personally. Because I'm your pastor, you allow me a window into some of your finances. So I already know that many people who are watching right now, you don't have issues with your money. Not the same type of issues that everybody else has, right? You, you don't have problems making rent every month. You don't have problems paying your car note. What you have problems with, you have problems with um, the hiring staff that, you, that you've already got with you. You have problems with, if I should allow this person to work for me, um, even though it seems like they don't care about what I've invested in uh, my entire life. Now, there are some of you out there who are struggling on a consistent basis on how to put food on a table or how to complete all of your bills without lacking in other areas. And I just want to meet you where you are. But the first thing that you have to do, no matter if you are in either situation, you have to identify the source of your anxieties. And here are a few questions and you see them on the screen that you wanna ask yourself. The first is this, did some event occur unexpectedly, Un unexpected events. Is that the cause or the source of where you, where you are? Second, are, are, you, are, are my spending habits or are my spending habits out of control? That's question number two. And I'm not giving you time to answer this. I want you to write them down because I, I need you to ask yourself this later. Here's another one. Am I not earning enough to provide? 
Now, every person that's watching right now, every question that we're talking about today, I need you to answer those in your own time, in your private time, so that you can see where you need to change. Here's the fourth question. Have I confused my needs with my wants? Four questions. I believe that if you answer those questions properly and truthfully, Last one is real. Have I confused my needs with my, my wants? I don't know if a person needs Hulu Live. I was talking to one of my, my team members just a few minutes ago, and they said, man, you know, I know somebody who's paying $50, $60 on Hulu Live, and they need to save more money. Well, my question is, if they always knew that they needed to save money, then why did they have Hulu Live in the first place? Is it a need? Well, I'm gonna be bored. So you rather be entertained and broke versus bored and plentiful. Ooh, I know I'm tapping on stuff that people don't wanna to talk about. For four, four major areas that I just asked you about. One, did some event unexpectedly happen? My spending habits out of control. Am I earning enough to provide? Am I confusing my needs and my wants? The first one that I'm gonna talk about is unexpected events. Let me help you by telling you this. The unexpected will happen. Honestly, that, that's probably worth an offering right now. The, the unexpected is going to happen. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Are you wishing bad on me? No, no, I am not. But I'm going to tell you all about me. I am the king. Listen to me. The ruler, the king, the head honcho, the boss of flat tires. No, seriously. I am the king of flat tires. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how in the world nails happen to find my particular tire. But I am absolutely telling you that it is to a point right now that I am expecting. Now I'm gonna have a flat tire about eh, two to three times a year, out of the blue. But I remember there was a season where even though it was happening to me consistently, I would always act surprised. Flat tire, how did this happen? Listen to me, for those who have school-age kids, one thing that we don't like is when there is a teacher who sends something to our school and they say, go sell candy. Now you know, if your baby about as lazy as my baby, I, I'm, don't, don't show this to my, my son, if your baby is lazy as my baby, you gonna have to buy some candy because you don't want your baby to look bad when they go back to school, unexpected. The unexpected is going to come. They're going to come to your house. Ooh, this is going to get somebody. Ooh, type out your amen when I say this. The meter reader comes out to your house. Your bills have been steady. You kind of know what they're going to hit. They readjust your meter, and your bill goes up $20. Didn't expect it. But the unexpected is going to come. Hear me when I say this. It is not just putting money away for your savings. It's not just putting money away for investments. It is putting things away so that when the unexpected actually happens, you can be prepared for it. If there's anything that I can tell you about this life is that there is a place where things are going to change. And when things shift, things happen. And when things happen, we have to be prepared for it. Pastor, you're going to have to give me scripture. I promise you, that's coming. I'm going to give you these, 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 these principles right now. Spending habits. Spending habits. What I've come to find out is that budgeting is important. But I've learned from Dave Ramsey, right? I've learned from Dave Ramsey. He teaches you. One, how to steward your money and to make sure that God is always first. 
But the second thing he teaches you is to build a budget around who you are. So many of you, hear me, you have a grocery budget. You do. You have a grocery budget. And you're spending $100 a week on groceries. The catch is you're never home. Now you got $100 worth of groceries sitting inside of your refrigerator. But here's the catch. Since you're not home, you eat out. So you spent an extra $100 throughout the week to eat out. And a person would say, well, I had to eat. I agree. Well, I have to have groceries. Well, do you if you're not there? This is shaping your spending habits. Because what we'll do is we'll convince ourselves that we need something that we actually don't need. For those who are similar to my wife and I, what we do is we cook. We do. If you see me throughout the week, I'll have a lunch pail. My wife packs my lunch when I leave out in the morning because we know what our natural inclination is, but you have to set up things so that you can guard yourself from the enemy going through your mind telling you that you need those chicken McNuggets. Spending habits. So now the first question is, hey, did something unexpected happen? If something unexpected happened, then I got to make sure that I get it done. Secondly, is what are the spending habits that has you bound up and chained up? And I talked this past weekend about investments. And I talk about the parable of the talents. In Matthew 25, right? And I told you that you need to invest your money in things that you get a return. And I believe that many of us, we have spending habits that don't match our actual lives. I remember when we were starting the church and the government was giving all of this money to individuals, how it was so hard to buy a computer for the ministry because they were almost sold out by individuals who don't need that level of a computer. Spending habits. Being house poor. You ever heard of that? A spending habits. Well, I got my education and I got this certain amount of job and I believe I'm supposed to live in a house like this. Well, everybody don't have that type of debt you have either. So now you live in a mansion, but you have to eat Bologna sandwiches, and there's nothing wrong with bologna sandwiches, but for me, that was the last resort. So I don't want you to be put in that position where we're thinking based out of lack, but we need to guard and we need to check our spending habits, write down the budget or download apps. There are apps out there that you can download right now that will categorize everything that you spend and you will be surprised because I was on how much $5 every time you go to the gas station, you spend $5 on snacks, how much that adds up over the course of a month, over the course of six months, over the course of a year. If you wasted $5,000 just to play around, under earning, now, this is an area where we have to be sensitive, right? Have to be sensitive because there are individuals who are under earning and they just don't make enough. But what I am trying to help you understand, and I am a pastor who's going to meet you where you are. There are so many ways in this day and age that you can make a buck. I was telling the guy the other day that if you don't have a job, you don't want a job. Because it doesn't matter if it's a tech industry job, or it doesn't matter if it's at the gas station that's actually on our property. Everybody's hiring. Every person's hiring. And what many have done, and I'll just be honest with you, unemployment was at an all-time high. Now unemployment is stopped, and now everybody's rushing to the places that had their doors open for the last six months. I'm not saying that's you. But what I am saying is that there is a way to come back under earning, pushing yourself academically so that you can apply for the promotion. 
Going out and putting yourself out there so that you can actually get the things that you want to get in life. Under earning is real, but here we go. I truly believe the first thing that we can do to combat under earning is investing not only our time, not only our treasure, I mean, not only our time, not only our talent, but our treasure into the kingdom of God. The Bible says that there was a woman who obviously under-earned in her life because when it was time for offering, she gave two mites. Those two mites, some may say, equals a penny. So let's say she gave the equivalent of a penny and God said that she had given more than anybody else. And it was because it was out of her lack that she gave. And because it was out of her lack that she had gave, God had recognized her. And you can't tell me God didn't bless her. So now those three things were unexpected events, spending habits, under earning, and then last but not least, confusing our wants with our needs. Do I need to stay there? I talked about it before. Do we need to pay the $7 a month for the tablet game so that you can have Wi-Fi everywhere else? Do we need to have uh, Verizon? T-Mobile may drop a call, but it's going to drop your bill also. We need to have the newest pair of shoes. Nope. You get the same pair of shoes, but if you wipe them off every day, I believe that they may stay fresher than, than just getting new pair of shoes. All the, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just talking. I'll give you scripture. Luke chapter 12 Verses 13, 13 through 21, right? They tried to get Jesus to interfere with the way their estate is going. Jesus then pulls back and he says, who am I to get into your arbitrary affairs? But basically he says that you guys should Get together, figure out, one, how to honor God, but don't put so much stock in what you have to where you're not understanding the full picture of what I can do. But sometimes we haven't tapped into what God can do is because we haven't necessarily partnered with him in the planning stage. So many of us, the reason why I like this scripture is because they ask God in the beginning, hey, get, in, get involved. And what I am trying to tell you is that many times we have already planned something and asked God to get involved after the plan is already underway. What I am letting you know is that God loves to be asked to be involved in the foundation and here's what I am trying to help you understand and how you can succeed in your finances. Here it is. Make a plan and stick to it. Write the vision. Make it plain. So that people can run with it. We're running without a plan. And I'm hoping that you truly understand that, that God is going to, what's the plan? You build a budget. So for my household, let me be clear, I don't manage the finances in my household. My wife does. So my wife, she manages the finances in our household. And so with all of that being said, what she does every single month, I give her all the kudos in the world. Every single month, I see her in the sala in the dining room and she's sitting down with a long sheet of paper. She still does it on, with, with a pencil and piece of paper and she says, okay, phone bills are this, this is how much money we got coming in. And she, to the point where I don't even, let me get free, I can't even swipe my bank card. She sends me money to my cash card and says, don't swipe your bank card because there are no money allocated to you. So your haircut money, swipe your cash card. 
your gas, that's allocated. So no, this is what you said you had to do throughout the week. So this is how much gas you need to get around the city and around to your appointments. So no, you cannot just randomly take excursions to Africa because that's not built into the budget. And what we are going to do, we're going to stick to the budget. My wife, no games. The man is supposed to handle the resources. No, because for me, I'll give that money away. <laughs> No, let me see somebody in need. I'll give you everything I got. But there's a limit on that. And my wife says, listen, I'll take care of it. But what does she do? She creates a budget. Another thing that my wife is always taking care of, she knows how much debt everyone has in the house. She knows when the student loan payments are going to come out. She knows when the car payment is going to come out. She knows the, the, the debt to income ratio in our household. If we went to go apply for a car right now and they asked a question about our debt, she would know it just like that. Two things right there. Understand, build your budget, but then also defeat your debt. Here it is. And some people may disagree um, depending on what you watch or depending on what you look at. Um, I would say then start putting money in your savings. Some would say then invest in some, something that will be able to make residual income. But here it is. You can't do either one of those without understanding what's coming in, what's going out, and what and who you owe. Budgeting, debt cancellation, and then once you're done with that, you are trying to figure out where you can put something else. Look what the word of God says. I believe that once you do those, this idea of wealth, this idea of having more, this idea of surplus, it'll start coming, but it comes incrementally. It comes incrementally. I mentioned it this weekend, but here's the verse. Proverbs 13, 11, it says, Wealth hastily gotten, quick money, will dwindle, but those who gather little by little will increase it. Have you ever wondered how athletes can go from being dirt poor, 18, they get a contract worth millions, but they don't know how to manage it? Wealth hastily gotten, quick, quick money. So when it comes that quick, you think that it's always going to come that quick. But when you work for it, when you put something away, and here it is, for those who maybe got a, a beautiful game plan, a beautiful business, a beautiful company, you invested your money properly, and you got quick money, hear me when I say, find someone who can help you. We don't fully take advantage of our banking systems. Those who Chase Bank and uh, PNC Bank, I'm not pumping any particular bank, Fifth Third Bank, right? A person who's watching right now, they have things in place. Where they can actually help the individual. It's not just a company perspective um, of how they help people. Take advantage of the resources that you have around you. Because you want to acquire wealth for your family on whatever level suits your lifestyle. No, you may not have as much as the next person, but you have what you need. And how about this? I want you to move past your needs and get to a place where you can actually get what you want. Another verse, it says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to want. Those who plan diligently will come into abundance. God, I want you to do a miracle. He can do a miracle, but you still have to plan for the miracle that he's given you. God, I want more money. What would you do with more money without a plan? God, I want a bigger house. What would you do with a bigger house without a plan? God, I want a better car. What would you do with a better car without a plan? Those who plan. And once you have a plan, hear me. Once you have a plan, then that'll help you deal with the anxieties. Oh, did you forget what we were talking about today? Once you have a plan, the plan will help you deal with the anxieties. It will help you deal with the, hear me, worry. 
Because those are two things that I don't believe God wants you to, to suffer through. Here it is. I'm about to read this verbatim. It says, Jesus taught that worry is futile. It produces no fruit. There's literally absolutely nothing that comes from it. Worrying would make sense if it was productive, but it isn't. Worrying about a situation doesn't prevent it from happening. The moment we sense ourselves worrying about money, let's recognize it and go directly to God with that concern. So push aside the worry. And the only way that you can push aside the worry is that the moment you feel it, give it to God. But even when you give it to God, many of us are such control freaks that even though he has it in his hand, when we don't have a plan, we fail. And you heard the analogy, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. We are not poor. We are not broke because we don't have. It is because we did not plan. And we are worrying and stressing ourselves because we never sat down in the sala, the living room. We never sat down in the dining room and wrote it down. Because then that puts parameters on what you can do. Next, this is about to sound weird, but I'm going to give you a scripture and you'll understand what I'm saying. Think of the birds. There's a song called Jaira. Many of you guys hear it and you love it. I think it's Chandler Moore and Naomi Rain. But it says, if you, um, if you dress the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more would he clothe you? The reason why I am saying this to you is because what? She's trying to tell you in this particular song is that God dresses them. He provides for them. So not only push the worry aside, but what she's saying is that the birds never worry about how they're going to be provided for. And how much more would he do for you? So you think like birds because, Jaira, you are enough. Enough. Provider, you are enough. So I push the worry to God because I understand that God is enough. That with my limited ability to plan, partner with his great ability to see plans through, he's enough. And if I think like a bird, if I just wake up and I just know that he's going to take care of me, I'll worry less. But here's a verse for you. Matthew 6, 26, it says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And can any of you, any of you by worrying, any of you by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. You combat worrying with prayer and preparation. That's finance. And no, you won't learn this in your classes for your MBA. You won't learn this in your classes with accounting because they won't tell you that prayer actually works within your finances. They won't tell you that the kingdom structure is actually probably better than any other structure. They'll never admit that when he set up this idea of 10% from everyone that it could actually take care of the world. That we wouldn't have poverty in certain places if 10% was legitimately structured between every person in the entire world. We wouldn't. I know rich people who would say the same thing. 
So what I'm trying to tell you is that if you follow the kingdom principles of stewardship and you move worry to the side and you make a plan, you make a budget, you kill debt because God has always called you to be the lender and not the borrower. When he puts you in position to understand how to use the world system against the world and use it to help and to push the kingdom when he says make sure that you pray make sure that you prepare and then everything that you have in the natural I'll put super on top of that but I'm telling you now the reason why we have more problems when we have more money is because there's a certain type of anxiety that comes with it and the way that you combat that is by making a plan and staying prayerful that God will always meet you where you are. I promise you, at the beginning of this year, our team, my wife and I, we're going to set up classes where you get the chance to come in. Classes that actually help my wife. The Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. If you never read it, it'll change your life. We got the opportunity to kill more debt with, no, with, with, with not more money, with just a renewed mindset. I believe it'll change your life also. But I wanted to talk about finances now because it seems like we're always waiting to the new year to get better. But I'm saying if you get better right now, your new year, you will go into your new year feeling better, rejuvenated, that you don't have to start over then because you had already taken the hit to start over now. And I also want to talk about this because we're going into the holiday season. So when we start talking about needs and we start talking about wants, you don't need to buy all of those toys. You don't need to have the largest spread, but what you need is to create margin in your life so that you can go to another level. That's what you need. And as your pastor, as your leader, as the person who you allow to steward your soul, I want your household to match the mentality of ours. That if it interrupts peace, then you should get rid of it. So if your spending habit interrupts peace, then get rid of it. If your circle of friends influences your finances to the point where you go on trips that you don't necessarily need, that's something that you need to get rid of. Because I believe that God is calling you into a place of abundance and overflow. If you make, if you make decisions that look like him. Listen, for those who are watching right now, yes, this is more pragmatic. Yes, this is more topical, but it's absolutely needed. And I believe that the God that I serve will always want you in a good position. And maybe you don't know the God that I serve. His name is Jesus Christ. And I'm asking that if you don't know him, you text this number so that we can help you to gain relationship with the one who can do in your finances, in your life, in your marriage, in your emotions, in your spirit, in your mentality, exceedingly abundantly above all that we can hope, ask, think, or imagine. Then obviously, for those who are watching right now, if you are getting something, then so will you grow. I told you this past weekend, I don't listen to a word. I don't go into another man's house. I don't receive the way I'm supposed to receive without putting something on it. That's just me. But if what flows from the head gets to the body, what I am saying to you is that if this blessed you in any way, shape, or form, then put something on it. No, no, I'm not about to give you a specific amount. Pastor, you always saying $20. Hey, if you got that, put that in. But I don't care if you put 50 cent in. I believe that it's going to be part of a seed that's going to change your life. Well, I won't keep you too much longer. I know there's a lot of sports going on and family stuff going on. I just want you to get back to them. But in the midst of all of that, push to push the kingdom agenda. And I believe you'll be blessed. I love you, but God, he loves you so much more. God bless you. If he dresses the lilies in beauty and splendor, how much more would he clothe?